So there was nobody on the streets at the time. And we said, you know what? Don't we pull down some red flags and take them home as souvenirs? Try to climb up those, those poles to pull down the flags. And all of a sudden, the car pulls up next to us. There's two guys in the car. Oh, he said, this is KGB. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. You will remember Karl Heinz from our episode where we talked about him being a signaller on the West German destroyer Hamburg in the late 1970s. Today we follow his post-Navy life as a travelling supporter of football club HSV Hamburg, where he followed them all over the Soviet bloc and talks about watching them play Dynamo Berlin, the Stasi side, and drinking with Liverpool and Hamburg legend Kevin Keegan in a hotel bar in Tbilisi. And his Cold War encounters don't stop there. Whilst working in Chile, he met General Pinochet, the military dictator of Chile, from 1973 to 1990, as well as living across the street from Margot Honecker, the wife of East German leader Eric Honecker, as well as being an influential member of that country's communist regime until 1989. If you have listened this far, I know that you are enjoying the podcast, so I'm asking for one-off or monthly donations to help support my work and enable me to continue producing the podcast. If you become a monthly supporter via Patreon, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, plus audio and other extras. And you also bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us as well as sharing us on social media and you can interact with other listeners if you join our facebook discussion group where guests and listeners just like you continue the cold war conversation just search for cold war conversations in facebook i'm delighted to welcome carl heinz back to our cold war conversation i was a Still well, kind of supporter from Hamburg, but of not because that's modern football is a different story. Yeah, but back then I was still a big fan. I used to be a member of one of the fan clubs, which is the uh, old or the actually the oldest fan club of uh, the Hamburg football team, which is the Rothosen, the Red Pants, which was founded in 1972. It still exists uh, with the old members, some of them, they're still alive. And um, we were actually a group who went to most of the games, let it be in Germany, in the Bundesliga, or also international games, since Hamburg played international in those years, uh, all over the place, wherever they went, let it be in Liverpool or Scotland, or in this case, Eastern Bloc. So uh, we also went, of course, to East Berlin, whenever Hamburg played in, uh, in West Berlin, had a BSC, and uh, that even before I joined the Navy, which we also had some interesting stories because we tried to always travel for a weekend. So if a game would have been on a Friday night, for example, we would stay on the Sunday, or in one time we spent an Easter weekend there, and to, to just see, sightseeing or whatever, have a good time. And uh, of course, we went also to East Berlin in those days, and which was always funny because we had a good time. And back then, when you went over, from you could stay, I believe, until 10 p.m. in East from uh, visit East Berlin until 10 p.m., then we have to return to West Berlin. And you could not leave East Berlin. East Berlin. You could not go to Dresden, for example, You're only in East Berlin. So that is what we did. And uh, the beer was cheap. Uh, was not too good, but it was cheap. And you always had to exchange, in those days, 20 West German marks into 20 East German marks. And to spend 20 East German marks in one day was almost impossible. But on the other hand, you were not allowed to take any change that you have left back to the West. So actually, you had to give this money away or throw it away yeah, because it was too much to spend. There's nothing to buy. The beer is cheap. So that's about it. So when we went to East Berlin, always we had a good time. Um, one time, I remember we met uh, some fans from Magdeburg who were playing 
an East Berlin team back then. And we ended up with them, of course, drinking beer and having a good time and so on. And many of them were actually uh, very critics of the East German system, of course, and anti-communist, anti-system. Anti and some of them had been jailed in, in their past. So, um, and I remember one story there, one anecdote, uh, which had beer, but the place didn't have anything to eat. So I, one of the Magdeburg guys and I, we said, oh, we are hungry. And he said, yeah, I know a place where we can get a sausage. So we said, okay, let's get a sausage over there. And uh, it was spring, not too warm, but not too cold. And I had a jacket where I kept my passport in my pocket there with a zipper. And one of my friends, he didn't bring a jacket. So he said, oh, can you take care of my passport? You put it in your pocket and you zip it up so I won't lose it. I said, yeah, of course. So I took the passport. And of course, when we went with this guy from Magdeburg to have a sausage, uh, I took along my friend's passport. So uh, since we did not return right away, uh, we ended up drinking more beer, the Magdeburg guy and I, and it got closer to 10 p.m. So I said, sheesh. There was no, of course, no WhatsApp, no telephone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we went to the British Dasse, which was a place, a subway station, when you go to the west, which we had to take the, the, the U-Bahn, the subway. And uh, my friends were already there, and they were mad as hell on with me because they said, "Where are you coming from? What happened to you? You got lost." And uh, uh, Doctor, who is my friend who gave me his partners, he is in jail right now because of you and, and whatever. I said, "What happened?" Well, since you didn't come back, we thought you were lost, and we tried to go back to the West. But since Doctor, which was his nickname, my friend, he didn't have his documents, so he tried to go with his ID card, with his West German ID card, but they didn't accept it and jailed him. They put him in jail. Oh. <laughs> so, so I had his passport, so of course I took out the passport. My friend, the other friend, went over to the authorities, and, and said, he has his passport, and this guy, well, he had it because he had a jacket, he has locked it up in his pocket, blah, blah, blah. So they, they let him out, and he was, ah, oh, he was pissed, my friend. He said, ah, oh, you idiot, you jerk, what did you do to me? I spent in, time in jail here, and there was those other East German guys, and then all the time screen, let me out of here, let me out of here. I was going crazy in there. So, <laughs> so I said, I'm sorry, you know, and then we took the train and then went to the West and again, we had another beer and we had another anecdote. That's, that's so, a good anecdote, that one, Carl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had another one when we were on the transit trains, leading East, uh, leaving West Germany back to Hamburg. And you also have a passport uh, control on the trains from the Bopos, from the Fox police side. And I never seen something again like that. The Bopo came in, came in into our apartment and train, and he was drunk. So, and uh, we had our passports, and some had the ID cards because they didn't have a passport, and they had to pay a fee for the transit, I believe 10 marks if you don't have a passport, but you have the West German ID card, uh, you pay a fee 10 marks, and then you you, you travel. Yeah, that, that wasn't a problem. But uh, we were kind of having beer a good time. And we said, oh, let's have to look at our apartheid pictures. Let's see who has the most ugly picture. So we opened up the parts and I was laughing at the pictures. You know, passport pictures can be very funny. And one of our friends, he had only an ID card. And uh, at those times, you could pull out the pictures from the from the passports and so on. It was not like today. Yeah? So we were laughing at him. And we said, hey, you're the most ugly one and so on. So he ripped off his passport picture and threw it out of the window of the train <laughs> before the control. So what are you doing, you idiot? You're not going to be back to Hamburg. So, but anyway, so the, the Bopo came in and the Bopo was drunk. So we had drinks, we had Bacardi, we had beer. So we offered him some Bacardi Coke. I said, yeah, sure. He sat down with us and uh, had his Bacardi Coke and talking about stories and so on. And uh, then, of course, he had passports. And I said, yeah, but this guy doesn't have a picture in his, in his ID card. So let me see. Ah, he has got stuff anyway. <laughs> so that was kind of funny too. So we were very surprised about that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, what did he talk about when he was drinking with you? Football, because he, he knows that we were football oh, okay. fans. So. Yeah, the universal language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was that was kind of funny because he said, yes, you're not, you're not going to make it back to Hamburg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was lucky, very lucky. Yeah, in, in the European Cup, for example, um, we played Dynamo Tiflis from Georgia, which was back then, of course, part of the Soviet Union. So, uh, of course, you cannot freely travel to the Soviet Union, 
So it was all chartered business. And uh, actually, there were two planes departing on the charters uh, from Hamburg to Tiflis, yeah, uh, which was organized by, by the club. And uh, of course, since one of the oldest fan clubs, we were able to get tickets and on those planes. And uh, we left, the game was on a Wednesday, and the games, and we left on a Tuesday and returned on a Thursday back to Hamburg. And the planes were from Aeroflot. And we had to change planes in Moscow. So it was flying from Hamburg to Moscow, change planes in Moscow to Tiflis. So we left, I believe, 8 o'clock in the morning, whatever, everything fine. Everybody on board of the planes. We bought in the duty-free shop in Hamburg or, or liquor. And there comes a car that you get in the service at the airplane. And the, the, in the, our guys in the first row, they said, oh, that looks like beer bottles, like those half-liter beer bottles, the brown bottles in Germany that they had or still have. And uh, oh, they have beer on board. They communicated, oh, perfect beer, perfect. Beer. So they got the bottles, but it wasn't beer. It was kind of a Russian soda. So, of course, oh, don't drink that, it's Russian soda. Yeah, so nobody drank that stuff. But again, we went to, came, arrived in Moscow. We had the first inspection, customs, luggage, and everything you had in Moscow. And some of the group, some guys of the group, they actually took stuff along to sell in Tiflis, like, like, jeans or nylons or whatever, cigarettes. Yeah. So actually the, the border controls, they did not confiscate that stuff. They could leave and then uh, take the trip then on the, the, the flight to, to Tiflis. And then again in Tiflis, there was a, another control, the same as in Moscow, passports, luggage and everything. Yeah. But again, they could take their, their jeans with them. It was not a problem, but it was time consuming, time consuming, of course. So, since we didn't, or I and my friends, we didn't have any jeans or stuff like that. We just had our clothes in our luggage. So um, we went to the bus, which was waiting outside. And we take, took our seats and to wait for the other guys to come over after the procedure, procedure ends. And in the front of the bus, there were two Georgian guys standing there. Older, well, not older guys, but middle-aged guys. And uh, they were smoking and they're having a bottle of vodka in their hands, drinking vodka there on the bottle right in front of our bus. So one of our guys said, oh, I'm going to share a cigarette with those guys. So he went out of the bus. Of course, he couldn't speak any Russian or let it, not even Georgian. And those guys couldn't speak English and uh, or not German. So, but again, you know, people talk, uh, they talk. Yeah, with hands and, and feet and whatever. Uh, he offered us some cigarettes from his box that he was smoking. And great. And said, yeah, you see my friends there. Yes. And they were waving and he went back to the bus, waving to each other. And then two KGB guys came and arrested those two guys. And so this just took them with them. So, but then again, the, the, the tour guide, it was an organized tour guide, obviously, was a young lady uh, from Georgia who spoke perfect German. And she said, yeah, I'll be your tour guide. And tomorrow we have a sightseeing tour and so on. Right now we will go to your hotel and you check in and blah, blah, blah. Uh, there were only two hotels for Westerners back then in uh, Tiflis. We went to one of them and the team went to, to the other hotel. So we checked into the hotel, uh, got our room keys and, and so on. And on each floor, there was a lady watching over the floor. I don't know what if it was security or whatever, but there was a lady, a typical Russian lady, uh, heavy weight and, and this and that. So we always called them Olgas. And each floor had his own Olga. And so we saluted them, of course, courtesy nice people and so on and uh, then we had our dinner and uh, the hotel actually had a, a kind of a discotheque yeah uh, downstairs uh, only German beer uh, Dutch uh, Danish beer Tuborg and so on and you of course had to pay with either dollars or West German marks or British pound yeah so we went there and had some drinks and then well we went to sleep so the next day we had our sightseeing tour which not everybody took I took it a uh, beautiful place, nice people over there, very interesting. And some other guys who didn't take the bus tour, they just said, no, we are walking down the streets ourselves. The same day was the day of the revolution, the Russian revolution, November. So it was, of course, crowds everywhere, parades, flags all over the place. And many of our guys who, who just walked the streets, they actually got invited by the Georgians into their homes to have tea. They offered them food. Fantastic. They didn't speak any language. They couldn't communicate in one way or another. Yeah, but they were invited to the homes and then and shared tea and then food and whatever, you know. So they were very impressed by that. Yeah. So again, we took our sightseeing tour. Very nice place. Lots of history there. 
And then in the afternoon, evening, of course, we had to take this bus uh, to the stadium. Yeah, you could not take a taxi or whatever. It was all forbidden because it could not walk freely in that sense to the stadium. And of course, we were wearing our color scarves and so on. And the same two lady, the tour guide, uh, she was also on the bus, of course, uh, bringing us over to the stadium. She invited about 50 friends and family within the same bus. So it was us, 50 persons, for example, per bus, all seated, and all her friends and families came over. She said, no, these are my friends and family, and then they will go with us to the stadium. They didn't have any tickets or whatever, you know, but just they went with the group and, and were able to enter the stadium. Yeah, they were standing in the, in the, in the bus and because there were no seats, yeah, and then take them over to the stadium. And I remember there was one gorgeous Georgian lady, young lady, and I offered her a seat on my lap, actually, kind of a joke. Yeah, but again, she didn't speak English, German, I didn't speak their language. Uh, so she sat down on my lap during the bus trip. And uh, she spoke a little French, and I spoke a little French at that time. So we started a communication, which was interesting. So we got to the stadium, we had our tickets, and all those people also went into the stadium, different entrance, whatever it might have been. Uh, what I remember is the stadium, stadium for 80,000, there were about 120,000 in the stadium. And what I remember most of the stadium also are the toilets. Uh, if you want to have uh, your big business, you could have it, but uh, the places for that, the, the stalls, they didn't have doors, and you would have to make it into a hole. Nice. Yeah. So, and of course, everybody could see you yeah. what you are doing right there. No? So that was kind of, I still have that in my memory. No? So again, but then the, what the game, and then the, we were surrounded by police, of course, so that nobody could get closer to us from the, from, the, from the Georgians. And after the game, we went back to the hotel, of course, with the same people who went, the family and friends of the tour guide. And uh, again, the same girl, the same lady again with me and so on. And we tried to invite them into the hotel for a drink. They said, no, you can't. They wouldn't let them in. And so they went their way and we went our way. And of course, we went back to the discotheque bar uh, for some drinks and so on, beer. And uh, there was, of course, it was also a table in the corner where three Russians or Georgians KGB guys were sitting. You could tell by the clothing or whatever that there were no Westerners. And the music actually in this place was very lousy. So one of our guys, he, had, he brought with him a tape recorder. And when you enter the Eastern Bloc, you have to declare what you take with you, how much cash, what currency, uh, any items like a tape recorder, etc., etc. So he had to register it on his list. So he brought down his tape recorder with some rock and roll tapes, uh, you know, Chuck Berry or whatever, and changed the music. And then one of the three guys from the KGB came over and said, oh, the tape rec and in German, a tape recorder. Very interesting. I want to buy it. And he said, what do you mean? You want to buy my tape recorder? Yeah, I want to buy your tape recorder. How much do you want? The tape recorder was old. It had missing buttons were missing and whatever. So I think he got, I don't know, $200 or something like that. So the guy... The KGB guy went home to get his money and paid him $200 for this old, basically obsolete tape recorder. So our guy was happy about the money, of course, but he said, you know, you look at your declaration, what you did. You have, said you have a tape recorder. Now you don't have a tape recorder, but you have $200 in cash. So, oh, shit. <laughs> so, so basically, that was the story for the next day when we went back. But then the same night, he said, well, why don't we go over to the the hotel where the players are. So I said, yeah, sure. The, the front desk arranged some taxis for us. So we went over to the uh, hotel where the players are. And there was still also around at the, at the bar from the other hotel. It was Kevin Keegan uh, talking to him and he bought us a round of beer and so on. Yeah, but then, of course, the players, the coach called them, ah, time to go to bed. So, and actually we left that hotel, I believe, around two in the morning. Uh, there were no, no taxis available, not to speak about public communication, uh, public transportation. And uh, we said, yeah, you know, the, the front desk guy explained to us how we can walk over to our hotel. We did that, a group of five or six people. And again, as I mentioned, it was a revolution day and they had the red flags all over the place. So there was nobody on the streets at the time. And we said, you know what, don't we pull down some red flags and take them home as souvenirs? So yeah, let's do that. So you know, it tried to climb up those, those poles to put on the flags. And all of a sudden, the car pulls up next to us. There's two guys in the car. 
an older guy and a younger guy. Oh, he said, oh, shit, this is KGB. Now we are being arrested for stealing flax here. So the older guy, the driver, got out, and he embraced and kissed everybody from us in our group, went back into the car. Then the guy, younger guy came out, and he did the same thing, went back to the car, and the car took off. So we were just sitting there thinking that was KGB who would arrest us. No? So, but then we got back to our hotel, and of course, everything was closed. And the next day, we were traveling back to, to via Moscow again, to Hamburg. And of course, we had our friend uh, worrying about his $200, which he put somewhere, hiding it in his shoes just in case, you know, in case it would control them. But he was able to get it out. Incredible, incredible stories. Did you go anywhere else in the Warsaw Pact countries for games? Yeah, East Berlin, and they played uh, uh, Berliner Football Club Dynamo. All oh, right, the Stasi, the Stasi Club. The Stasi team from Milan. Yeah, what was that like? It was also very restrictive, uh, only limited tickets for Hamburg fans. I believe in the, in the whole was 100. Um, and again, you have to travel in group, uh, what the group organizers did. And we had to spend one night in East Berlin. You're not allowed to go back to, to West Berlin to sleep over there. So we had to stay in East Berlin. And uh, so we had to do that. We got the tickets. and But instead of taking the buses, all the other guys, uh, two or three of my friends, we took a plane to West Berlin. You know, to not have this passport controls again, all this stuff, and uh, joined our group then later on when they came over from, from uh, Hamburg by bus, and then we went over the border together. Uh, so that was, then let us in easily enough. Uh, we had to check in into our hotel, and then, of course, to the stadium. We tried to take our banners to the stadium. We were not allowed to put, to, to, to put our banners on the fences or fly, wave any flags, nothing like that prohibited. Yeah, and uh, in the stadium, I believe there were 20,000 or something like that, but maybe 2,000 real football fans. The rest were just uh, party members or Stasi members who wanted to see this particular match. But uh, the real football fans really didn't have a chance to watch a game. But again, after we went uh, back to the hotel, and of course they had a hotel bar, uh, we had dinner, and then all of a sudden, Werder Bremen fans showed up as they were playing in Frankfurt, Frankfurt East Germany, Frankfurt Oder, and they put them up in the same hotel with us. But they did not know that uh, Hamburg and Bremen fans, they're like, uh, so it almost started up in a big brawl in the hotel bar. But later on, we started talking and uh, our experiences that they had and we had. And uh, of course, they had the, the best East German beer, the Radels, Bachel, Radelsberg, or whatever the name was. But we had to pay five German marks for one of those beers, which was extremely expensive. That was also kind of uh, restricted. And the other one was in, in, in Split in Yugoslavia, but uh, that was very open, actually. That was very open. There was no, no political stuff going on like that. One thing that might be interesting, it was just the days that uh, uh, Tito uh, was already in the hospital, was hospitalized, and I believe he died a couple of days later. And, you know, he was from Croatia. So the whole stadium was shouting Tito, Tito, Tito and stuff. Like yeah, that. I've so, seen photos recently of like a match that was called off because there was an announcement that Tito had died and the players the players yeah. are crying. You can't imagine that happening with many politicians nowadays. At least, well, perhaps in, in North Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, those are those are some stories there about your uh, football escapades. Um, when uh, uh, did you manage to speak to Kevin Keegan when you were in that hotel? Yes, 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 yes. I met him a few times uh, again in this hotel and other hotels and other places. Uh, we invited him also to our uh, fan club pub, our meeting place, and he was invited to, to uh, for a conversation there. He was uh, gave autographs and all the stuff and so on. Still today, he's a hero. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember him playing for for Hamburg. I mean, it was it was at a time yeah. when not many English players played abroad. Yeah, he was the right. first one actually. Right, that... and it was a big deal. I mean, it was something like like uh, I don't know, Neymar would join. I don't know what you know, or Messi, or you know, of course the amount of money that was exchanged back then was not that uh, tremendous as it is today. Yeah? But still, I mean the. the the impact. Yeah. You know? Could he speak German? He learned German and actually later spoke wow. some German. Yes. Oh, good for good for him. 
we're British aren't necessarily known for learning other languages. Yeah. So oh, he did. That's he good. Did. That's good. In in your notes you sent to me, you um you visited Chile in 1986, but um Correct. You, you met a couple of interesting personalities down there. <laughs> Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, when I went to Miami, I actually met my wife in Miami, who's a Chilean lady, I mentioned earlier, because she used to live also in Miami. And uh, I was working for this international shipping companies, and my boss back then knew that my wife was from Chile, and they wanted to set up a new office in Santiago, in Chile. And so he asked me, hey, would you like to go to Chile for a few years? I said, yeah, sure, why not? That was still in the time of Pinochet. So the first time I went there in 86, just to get an idea, meeting my wife's family for the first time and so on. And uh, then in 87 to 89, the company transferred me down to Santiago, and which was also kind of a historic time because in those years, uh, the, uh, they had the plus visit in, uh, in Chile uh, since uh, Pinochet was still around, the president, but according to what he arranged for in 1980, there would be a plus side in 1988, to see if it would continue as president or if there would be elections for a president. So in 1988, then there came up the stuff, and, and it was kind of not much going on. People were quietly, and um, each one had to go to vote. There was no voluntary voting. So the po whole population actually went to the polls. And uh, out of this 100%, Pinochet got 44%. And of course, the other guys got 56%. And then the process started of the uh, uh, presidential elections and uh, parliamentary elections and so on, which took about place in the next year. And then, of course, in March 1990, I believe, yeah, there was an inauguration of the of the new president. So, but again, there was this rumors that uh, Pinochet would not accept the results and this and that, which he did, and he worked out all the details that it was planned in the constitution and so on. So he did not uh, plan any military coup or, or to stay in power, nothing like that. So that is, uh, from that point of view, he followed all the rules. Uh, so he accepted uh, his defeat and set it all up. Now then, in between then, of course, uh, the, the wall came down in 89. And uh, that changed a lot of stuff and in the re international respect, uh, free countries to communist countries, et cetera, et cetera. And one international or inter perhaps an interesting aspect is the behavior of the Chilean socialist and communist parties. Yeah, because, you know, they were part of the Allende government. And um, many of them were exiles, of course, and, of course, for the elections and so on. And even earlier, they were allowed to return and to build up their political parties again. Yeah, so there was a socialist party, there was a social democratic party, all participating in this uh, plebiscite. So, but what those parties never had to change, like, for example, East German or East European communist parties, which then converted somehow to a more social democratic party, or whatever, those Chilean parties never went to through the through the process because they never had a wall which came down. Uh, they were actually taken out of office as the first ones in 1973. Yeah, many years earlier, uh, 16 years earlier before the wall came down. And uh, so it's, uh, still until today, you can see in the background in the history, in the way they, they perform the, the daily business, so to speak. They're still very much attached to, to Allende, not to actually when the wall came down. They didn't have they didn't have that experience. Did you meet Pinochet? I met him once, yes. Because um, since uh, it's a German Navy, I'm here much, very much associated with the Chilean Navy. Actually, some of my co-workers and friends they were serving in the Chilean Navy, and of course, you end up talking. And there's this Chilean Reserve Naval Club, which of which I'm also a member. And uh, they have also yearly activities and this and that. And then one, yeah, I met him, yes, taking his hand. <laughs> what was he like? Well, he was actually very much appreciated, even today in a certain sense, even though, I mean, it's uh, he passed away um, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, and again, there's a new generation, or two new generations after him since all those things happened. Uh, but he was very much liked in the sense that he brought order to the country, that the country had an, that he had an, a, a huge uh, economic impact, that inflation went down, um, uh, poverty levels went down, and so on. He laid the basics for that. So when the new president took over in 1990, in that respect, he didn't change anything. He continued the same politics of, of Pinochet 
in terms of economy, uh, social issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so that only changed in the last years, as when when it came back to to, to more left wing uh, politics and in the government, as Bachelet did, for example, and others, and it gets more to to in a certain way to a politic which is might be similar to Venezuela or Argentina today. Now, I, I understand you uh, you met somebody else who would be uh, quite interesting. <laughs> yes, I um, actually had a neighbor, a very famous neighbor, or unfamous neighbor, depends on your, whatever you want to look at it, which was Margaret Honecker. Um, I left Chile in 1990, went back to Miami, but then again in 1990, 94, I went back to Chile for the same company again. And of course, had the new, my new home right across the street. Margaret Honecker was living there because uh, Eric, Eric uh, already passed away. So she was a widow. And the place she was living at, actually, uh, you know that her daughter married a Chilean communist. And uh, they were living with her, grand, with her son or her grandson uh, right across the street from me. So uh, once in a while, of course, you saw her on the street or you met her or saw her at the local supermarket doing some shopping and so But actually, I never spoke to her. I never talked to her. Wow. <laughs> but you see, she still had her, you know. Has was her it still the purple? Well, I was going to I was going to ask that. Yes, wow. yes. Still had the same hair. And then she, she participated also, again, in those events from the communist or socialist parties where she was basically kind of a guest star. Yeah, she was still believed in the communist cause right to the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's a really interesting set of adventures you've uh, you've shared with us there, Carl. I really appreciate you uh, telling us all, all those stories. I mean, uh, I think Kevin Keegan's the most impressive out of all of them. <laughs> Perhaps. There's further information in the episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Mark Labance. Frederick Esposito, Darren Hughes, Jim Black, Ryan Vlaming, Stephen Kavalich, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group, where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.